Uh, good morning, and welcome to an uh, early Saturday morning session, maybe not so early anymore. Uh, my name is Eric Holm. Uh, I am the Executive Director of the Music of Asian America Research Center, and we're the co-sponsor of this event with PATH. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome Jason Chu, who, if you were here last night, gave an incredibly energetic show at, well, when did he start, 15, something like that? Something like that. <laughs> And it, it was really incredible uh, and a wonderful performer, hip hop performer, uh, all the way from Los Angeles, um, a part of Night Market. And that's how you probably know him first. And it's my pleasure to welcome Jason. Uh, and he will give a talk on appropriators or originators. Well, thank you for the intro, man. <laughs> Um, no, it's it's a real, real privilege and pleasure to be here uh, with y'all early in the morning. Uh, I flew out from LA on Thursday, so for me, it is basically 5 a.m. right now. Um, but it's, it's an honor to be here. Uh, it's especially an honor to be here at PATH. Uh, I know that, uh, I, I was saying last night, the Asian American Film Festival circuit is really in a lot of ways the backbone of a lot of Asian American culture, uh, especially over the last, you know, 20 years, so to be here is a huge, huge privilege. Um, so in, in this next roughly an hour, uh, we're going to dive into uh, one of the most fraught topics uh, in the current cultural conversation, uh, right? which is to say the ethics of cultural interchange. Uh, because we're, we're trapped between a rock and a hard place, right? especially as Asians in America uh, which, and by Asian, I definitely am going to point out from RIP that that includes a wide variety of people, right? Asian Americans does not mean East Asians in America. It doesn't uh, mean East and Southeast Asians in America. It doesn't mean East, Southeast, and South Asians in America. It also includes adoptees. It includes people of mixed race background. It includes a wide variety of conversations about our family narratives, right? How we wound up here and became or didn't, aren't a community. Uh, so just off jump, wanted to say that. So the first uh, thing to say, very specifically here, um, and hopefully I'm going to talk about some points that can wind up applying broadly across different cultural interchanges. Uh, but for me, in particular, as a hip hop artist, my uh, focus here will be between Asian Americans uh, and hip hop culture. Uh, but hopefully there's some overarching themes uh, that, can, that can spin out into any discussion of appropriation. So first we have to acknowledge the complicated nature of this relationship, right? It's not, it's not a single faceted uh, exchange. Uh, there's a wide variety of postures that both cultures, that both sort of communities have as approaching each other. Um, this ranges and in, in, in no particular uh, order, um, what I would term a uh, there's a benign fascination, right? There's this sense of there's something out there and we're interested in it. We want to we want to learn from it uh, without judgment, without judgment. I mean, let's be real, there's judgment. But at the same time, uh, if you'd like to come in, there's plenty of seats over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right, uh, I look at somebody uh, like Kendrick Lamar, right? And the way that, uh, so actually, uh, my boy Leo, uh, who's in my crew night market, his Cousin did some of the Kung Fu Kenny merch design. Is that right? Uh, so she was commissioned to do it, but it didn't actually go through. But if you go on her Instagram, you can see like all the art she did for the for the Kung Fu Kenny one. Yeah, right. So I think so. That's very interesting. Off jump, right? That like from I, I won't even get into that right now. There's this benign fascination of there's something there with power. There's something there that speaks to me. Uh, I want to learn. I want to learn. I want to engage. I'm attracted to it, right? And I would say that the same thing uh, now. You know, thank God he goes by Rich Brian, uh, 88 Rising, marquee artist, uh, Indonesian Chinese kid, grew up watching YouTube, learned English, learned slang from YouTube, and he has this. You know, now of course everything exists uh, in a cultural context, in a power dynamic. So we can definitely dive into that, which we will. But at the same time, right, there's this sense of interest and intrigue. Uh, so we, that, that's one posture. 
Another is, is a sense of belonging. Uh, now, what do I mean by belonging? I think it's extremely important that we not fall into the trap of white normativity and say that the only way to belong in America is to whiten yourself. What I mean by that is, uh, I remember, right, when Aquafina came out, uh, especially when she attained prominence on the national stage through crazy rotations, a lot of people were saying, why is she talking like that? Why is she in that movie? She don't sound like a Singaporean girl. She sound like a girl from Queens, which scans as black. But if you're a second generation child of immigrants, your parents showed up in America, they moved to Atlanta, they moved to Flushing, they moved to, you know, uh, the hood of Compton, Inglewood. You grow up in black America. And to critique the children of immigrants for adopting the Americanness that they were surrounded by is actually subtly a form of white normativity, which, you know, obviously we can see where that leads. Uh, because, you know, and so you get that, you get that. And so, so you look at somebody like Aquafina, you look at uh, somebody like Miss Info, Minya O, uh, radio host in New York. Um, you look at somebody like, uh, in the, on the flip side of it, you look at somebody like Rizzo, right? Somebody who, um, he didn't come in as a colonizer who was invited in. Right? People uh, like, uh, like, like Sophia Chang, who was Wu-Tang Clan's manager. Right? Wu-Tang's, some of their closest people in there with them were Asian Americans. Uh, like uh, like, like the, the, the Shaolin monk. Um, what's his name? Yen Ming? Anybody know? Mm -hmm. so, anyway, right? uh, so, so Sophia's ex uh, was the Shaolin monk who trained Riza in like Chinese herbal medicine and all that. So, there's some people who pierce through and despite whatever family background, whatever family heritage they have, achieve a form of belonging within these communities. They're not guests in hip hop, or they started off, the door was open for them, but they came in and they contributed to building the house, right? Um, now, there's unfortunately the negative posture is also, there's rejection, right? So, so you look very recently, uh, some of our friends in China have been affected by what's been, what was reported last year as a hip hop ban. Uh, now, uh, I mean, Kev knows how like complicated that shit was, but the truth is, it wasn't an all in, it, it, an out and out ban the way that people think. It was a complicated interchange of cultures where the Chinese government decided that there were certain elements of what they saw being uh, promoted through hip hop music and culture that they said that doesn't fit with our vision of what we want. So that was a form of rejection. Uh, the flip side of that, uh, I don't know if y'all remember, I'm on the East Coast now so y'all might remember, uh, a, a while ago, um, there was, uh, I think it was Hot 97, had this uh, tsunami song. It was like 12 years ago, 12, 13 years ago. Uh, there was a typhoon in Southeast Asia and then uh, they aired a parody song. Uh, that was just, just whack on every level, uh, sort of making fun of that, right? And I remember uh, Miss Info spoke up about it, Jin spoke up about it, um, but that was an example, right, of one culture looking at the other with uh, active and willful ignorance. That happens. And then last, there's straight up exploitation. There is out and out exploitation. When a Chinese pop artist decides to work with, you know, decides, uh, decides to do to you know, lock up their hair uh, just because they think it's tight, uh, and they do not give a fuck about the black community, right? When Chris Brown makes a song called "Fine China," and you know, I mean, Chris Brown already not the best with you know any femme identifying folks, much less where he's just straight up being like, you can imagine, right? So, so there's that. There's there is exploitation that happens too. So the question is, right? How do we sort through all these things with all this baggage, right? Every time we come into these situations of cultural interchange, it becomes so fraught because it's literally Russian roulette, right? I get it, I get it. You're a black person in America, you see somebody who phenotypically, there's a strong chance, I mean there's a chance I belong, but there's also a strong chance I don't. Every time it's a revolver at your head and you just spin and you don't know what's going to come out the other end. Same thing, right, for the API community. 
every time we go, <laughs> every time we see somebody who's a little too into anime, it's like, yo, my guy. <laughs> so, so, so who was swiping right on our Tinder? You know what I'm saying? Like, you, this is why we need to talk about cultural interchange with a high degree of sharpness and sophistication because it's so fraught. There's a lot of good that can come out of it, but there's so much danger. And if we don't have an articulated ethics and an articulated protocol for how we walk through these conversations, what we wind up doing is we keep charging in with hope. Like, oh, this is so cool. You know, like, maybe, I see this a lot right now in the entertainment industry. Yo, there's a lot of money in China and Korea. That's so cool, we should collab. Every time you jump into the collab, it's like, oh, so that's what you think about us. Or, oh, you're going to ask that question right now. Right? We need to think about these things in sophistication because there's real opportunities, which means there's real risks. Um, so, you know, there's a fundamental question. And again, this applies broadly across any conversation of appropriation and cultural interchange. Fundamental question, do, do, does group X belong in culture Y? Right? Um, this, when it really comes down to it, this is a question of ethics. Or at least when y'all somehow all woke up and drove over here and showed up for this. So you're invested in some way, I can tell. But the average person does not care. The average person just cares if it pops, if it's tight. Uh, but for those of us who want to do it and do it well, it becomes a question of ethics. Right? There's a couple premises here. Or there, there's a couple of, of facets to this question. There's a question of identity. Who are people, really? What does it mean to be really Asian American? Does being really Asian American de facto exclude me from incorporation into another community? Um, there's a question of belonging and ownership. Who gets to own a culture, right? Um, who gets to vote people in? Who gets to vote people out? Uh, and then there's also a question of use and responsibility. Right? Uh, what? Oh, I, we've been having these conversations in LA around gentrification, uh, use and responsibility. Right? What degree of complicity is too much complicity? What you know? What what? Where does where does this all fall? Um, so then, vice versa. You know, we gotta ask for for Asian Americans. We ask who belongs. Right? Can you marry in? You know, if you prove that, that you know, you're, you've got skin in the game, you know, can you be brought in by association? You know, uh, our, believe it or not, our, our agent in LA, uh, black dude, Chinese stepfather, starting an Asian frat in college. At what point are you like, all right, bro, you, you, you know, you put in for the culture. Um, and then can you study your way? Can you just know enough and navigate situations uh, or does it need to be more than that, right? Can, can you, uh, I mean, you know, I would just say Rachel Dolezal knows a lot about black people, but she also don't know anything about black people. <laughs> you think what I'm saying? So, so, so why it's who we know, you can't just study the shit. But these are questions, right? And because and, you look at someone like that, she clearly thought, if I just learn enough and I mimic enough and, and I understand certain things, maybe that's enough for me to get skinny. People think these things, right? We may not think these things sitting here, maybe we do sometimes, but, but we gotta know some people do. Alright, uh, I'm gonna skip past that. Well, okay, it's very important, first of all, to say, and I always say, or I try to always say when I'm on stage, uh, hip hop was started by black and brown young kids in the Bronx, uh, in the Boogie Down, um, who were going through experiences of cultural marginalization. If you don't know that shit, you don't know hip hop. Straight up, I don't give a fuck how good you can rap, I don't give a fuck how good you can dance if you don't know that this culture is built on the experiences and the ingenuity of inner city kids of color. That's not hip hop. That's just singing good. Um, with, and then also very importantly to tell, uh, Rolling Stone, they did a retrospective on Eminem that I thought was very telling. They were like, yo, M blew up and his mistake was thinking that it was his skill that people loved. People do love his skill. But it was his authenticity, it was his lived experience, that he was giving you the real stuff. Um, and so it's important uh, to know that from the, from the roots up, uh, authenticity 
and we'll, we'll discuss what authenticity means, because authenticity can actually mean mimicry, right? And so, sometimes in the lexicon, uh, authenticity gets used to mean how well do I play black, or vice versa, how well do I play white, or vice versa, how well do I play Asian, right? Oh, if, you know, I'm Chinese, if I walk into Koreatown, and I go, oh, no, 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 you know, like, I can, but, but authenticity doesn't just mean being able to pass, right, go deeper than that. So, that's the wrong thing. All right, section two, who's the end after this? What appropriation is and isn't. Um, oh, yo! What's up? Um, <laughs> no, that's, that's the hobby right there. That's it? Uh, you know, you can keep it low. Keep it low. Um, all right, so the question, right, of... I think it's very important, like I said, I, we need to have these conversations with sophistication. Uh, because it keeps coming up. So, I think it's important and I'm just saying, these are my working definitions. These are rules of thumb. These are kind of common sense, just what runs through my mind. I'm not telling you this is the end all and be all. Uh, I am, however, saying for me personally, and actually this has even shifted a little since I wrote these slides like a month ago, but uh, appropriation definitely, definitely means if you take someone's stuff, or you take someone's family's stuff, and you don't care about those people, that's appropriation. That's kind of my rule of thumb. Right? If uh, one of my friends, um, he runs this company called Boba Guys, and, uh, and they do a lot in the culture field. And he says, the, uh, his quote to me was, the antidote for appropriation is attribution, um, which is just as simple as, as giving homage, as letting people know, you know, this is where pointing back to the source, right? Um, I agree and I disagree a little bit, but there's got to be something about the people and the culture and the communities that generated the culture and the product, right? Um, uh, and if there isn't, then that's appropriation, right? Uh, taking a product, cutting off all of its ties to a people and a context, and saying, look how cool dreadlocks look. Look how cool Kung Fu looks. Look how cool, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, which is why, to me, something like, you know, you look at Bathe and Ink, right? One of the world's biggest streetwear brands now. Um, you know, Japanese owned and operated. Well, actually, it's Hong Kong owned and operated now. But, you know, Japanese founded. And Nigo was always very, very clear about where everything came from. You know what I'm saying? And, and you could be like, oh, you know, he sent. Uh, the clips, boxes of merch in Virginia, just because he knew it would be good promo, publicity, or whatever. But, you know, he works with James Lavelle from Uncle. He works with DJ Shadow. He's, you know, down with Futura, with Stash, like all of these people who are heavy in the culture. And so, to me, that's that level of saying, I'm not just going to take it and run with it. I'm gonna I'm gonna run the ball forward, but I'm always gonna make sure I'm passing the ball. I, I don't play football, so I don't. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying? Like he's not just saying he's not a ball hog. He's gonna pass it off. He's gonna make sure that whatever, like Big Sean and Two Chains perform at the date 25th anniversary in New York. You know, he's gonna make sure that there's a back and forth. Uh, so yes, yeah, so appropriation doesn't mean to me. And not everybody draws the line here, but I, I do think there's such a thing as a benign interest, um, as a non-willful ignorance, but a genuine ignorance. Uh, so for example, when I'm standing, uh, standing in line at the Panaderia in Los Angeles, and some Guatemalan woman is like, oh, where are you from? I'm not going to be like, whoa, 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 I'm American. Like, no, I get it. You think what I'm saying? Like, I get that she's, in her way, trying to relate and trying to understand. I remember uh, I was back, I grew up in Delaware. I was back in Delaware for one of my best friend's weddings. Uh, I was in the wedding party. And uh, this other, uh, you know, uh, Caucasian gentleman uh, who was in the wedding party, uh, very nice man, very nice man. Uh, he came up to me at the reception right after. And uh, yeah, we were chatting, you know, he was uh, the husband's friend and I'm the wife's we were in the hospital together. And he was like, oh, you know, so, so what do you do? And I'm like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm Chinese American, the pop artist, I live in Los Angeles. <laughs> and, and God bless his heart. 
uh, he said, uh, he said, oh, you know, what, what about really good friends in Vietnamese? I was like, word, word, you know, cool. <laughs> you know, like, okay. It's not willful ignorance. No, you know what I'm saying? Like, he's trying. He's trying. I'm, like, I'm an alien to him, bro. I am a rapper from LA in Middletown, Delaware, at like some brewery. And we're just hanging, and he's trying to survive any step toward me. Uh, so, in terms of cultural interchange, we're not close, but I would say to me, and of course that's not even close to appropriation, but to me, there is a benign ignorance. Where they're trying, they just don't know. They just don't know how to dance the dance, you know? And if this is the first class you're showing up to, you can't fault them for, for whatever, whatever. Um, we can talk about them, but this is just me. This is just me, all right? And then last, this existence. Whether you're a third culture kid, whether you're embedded within or existing within, between cultures. Um, we have to make room for that. Like I said, we have to make room for a Latino kid who grows up in Daly City and feels more Pinoy than Latinx. We gotta make room for Chinese kids who grew up in Flushing and you know spent high school like taking the the, the train in and out of the city. We gotta make room for them <coughs> to reflect what really are their roots. Um, and if we don't then that's actually repression, right? What's more regressive than saying, you don't look like you should be X, so therefore, I'm gonna assume that, that de facto, because of how your phenotype expresses itself, that you're not part of this, right? So we need to be sharp about how we talk about appropriation, okay. Oh, and the reason I titled it, uh, Bruce being and Dr. This, uh, is that, um, like Bruce Lee is, well, I mean, he's uh, groundbreaking in many ways. One of the main ways he's groundbreaking was he said, I'm going to teach everybody Kung Fu. He said, Chinese Kung Fu grows stronger the more people know it. The more different people we bring into the Kung. It's better. It's better for Kung Fu. It's better for me. It's better for the world. Um, so, and, and at the same time, Bruce Lee fought hard against the bullshit, right? He, you listen, I listen to some of the interviews he gave about what Hollywood would and wouldn't let him do, about why he had to go to Hong Kong to pop off. When he's Chinese American, <clears throat> when he had to go there because he couldn't break in, and he come and he was Kato. And there's this story about uh, the Bat when, when Batman and Green Hornet crossed over, he said, hell no, I'm not letting Robin beat me. <laughs> he was fighting day one, right? So so that's why I say Bruce Lee and Dr. This, because he, that man, you know, I look up to him, we look up to him in a lot of ways. And his whole, part of his whole legacy is, it's gotta be big, it's gotta be bigger than one phenotypical group, one nationalist group. All right, y'all get that.